So I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. It's obviously cold and wet, and um, it takes quite a good effort. So it's, a, it's a, a nice effort to have made, and I hope that it's very rewarding for people that have traveled quite some distances, in some cases, to be here. And that the, the, the purpose of the evening is to be interactive, so it's not going to be just um, our speakers talking to you, but they're hoping to um, have quite an interaction in terms of the relationship with the audience tonight. I'll, I'll start just by doing some housekeeping, which is to say that each speaker will may or may not speak briefly for about 15 minutes, and then we will have a break at around 8.30 for 15 minutes. Um, we're also having a raffle tonight for that beautiful Buddha image painted behind. So if you actually buy a raffle ticket, you have the opportunity to, to win that painting and take it home with you tonight. If people haven't seen it, so it's something to inspire your practice, whatever tradition you're from, images of serenity. So, I might also add that the, the topic of tonight is about salvation and liberation. And, and I guess in that sense it's inviting the questions of who or what is, is salvation for, and the same for liberation, and what are we being saved from? In the terms of the, the Latin root of the word, it means to save. There's also another root Latin word which means salve, and salve is, is a, a bound that heals. So, in that sense, salvation can also be related to healing. I'm not getting any. Is that better? Thank you. Okay, so salvation is also the root word being to hit, to save. And there's also another word in terms of a salve, a balm that heals people, or, or can be healing to people if you're injured. Um, I'll introduce tonight's speakers, with, and uh, just bear with me for a second. Donna Jacob Skyf, who is a Jewish woman and storyteller. David Milliken, who is a United Minister. And Ibrahim Al Ansari, who's a, a shape or teacher from the Sufi tradition. And finally, oh, well, I've forgotten, I'm so familiar with him, but Venerable Sujato, or Pante Sujato, who will also be representing from the Buddhist tradition, I, I assume. <laughs> so, there's no particular order, but I might just make it easy by passing it to the first person on my right. Actually, oh, good evening, everybody. Shall I stand up? No. no. Is that okay? okay. Can everybody see? Yeah. Okay. Well, good evening. Um, I thought it was about salvation and revelation. And so um, I thought that was what my email said. So that's what I've been thinking about. So it doesn't uh, matter. Right. That'll do. <laughs> so um, today, in fact, is a Jewish festival called Shavuot. Today is the day that Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received the Torah. So before I begin, I want to tell you something about the nature of the Torah, or the uh, five books of Moses, or the Old Testament, however you want to refer to it. The Torah is written without any vowels. So the word could be wound, or wand, or wind, or wind, it could essentially be any of those words, and all of those possibilities inform the word. In the Torah, consonants can actually be interchangeable, so essentially it could be land, sand, hand, it could be those things as well, and so those possibilities also inform the word. Hebrew is based on a system called shorish, which is the root of the word, and there are many roots for one word, and all of those possible roots inform the word. So essentially there are no words in the Torah, there are worlds, there are concepts, but never a certainty of a noun. In addition to that, there is also, they say, two Torahs. One is the black letters, and one is the spaces in between. And the spaces in between are what's called midrash. And the rabbis will take anomalies and contradictions and questions and they will write stories. 
and those stories become sacred text and inform also the Torah. And then there is um, something called Pides, which are the four levels of interpretation that we are required to bring to every reading of the sacred text. And I would say every experience and every moment in my life, if I'm lucky enough to remember. The four levels of interpretation, it's called Pides. In, it, it's an acrostic, which is often the case in Judaism. So the P of Pides stands for Peshat, which is the literal interpretation. And then the R of the word parades is remes, which is the metaphor, which is endless. And then the D is drush, which is the lesson, which is also endless. And then the S of parades is the word sod, which is the unknowable. And they're the four levels of interpretation that we are to bring to perhaps every moment in our lives. The rabbis say that the most difficult level is the literal. I personally don't really know what to do with the literal, so usually I just ignore it. In the Talmud, it is said, the Talmud, of course, is there's the Torah, and then there is the next sacred text, the Talmud. And the Talmud, it says that the fetus can see from one end of the universe to the other. And then when the baby is born, the fontanelles begin to close, that, that, that that um, when the baby's head is unprotected, there is this, um, as far as the Talmud is concerned, this absolute unimpeded communication with the source of all things. And as the fontanelles close, an angel comes and taps the baby right there above the lid where our little indentation is. And all knowledge is lost and trapped within us. And it is our quest, our life, to try and uncover the knowledge that we hold within us. In Judaism, we are born as perfect souls, unchangeable and, um, and eternal. As with the Garden of Eden, our beginnings are a glimpse of paradise. I forgot to say that pardes, those four levels of interpretation, the word pardes means paradise, suggesting, I guess, that if we bring those four levels to every moment of our life, we'll be living in paradise. Just as with Adam and Eve who ate from the tree of good and evil and are then thrust into the world of duality, so are we in our corporeal bodies thrust into a world of duality. And it's up to us to rediscover the world of oneness, just as we did when we were the fetus, when we were the infant. There's a legend of the Shekhinah, which kind of supports that idea. The Shekhinah in Judaism is the female aspect of God. The legend is, is that the Shekhinah, when the destruction of the Second Temple came and Jewish people went into exile, so did she. And she is still exiled from us and the, and the world. When the Shekhinah and God come together and reunite, that is when peace will come and the Messiah or the Messianic Age will begin. So male, female, good, bad, death, life, you, me, human, God, all of that is our, our role is to transcend and to find a place of oneness, Adonai Echad, God is one, and from that comes everlasting peace in the world. So how do we, in, from a Jewish perspective, achieve this sort of sense of oneness? As far as um, what happens to us after death, Jews largely, oh, well, how do we, how do we achieve this um, extraordinary state of oneness? I didn't actually tell you. It's through action, but I'll go back and tell you in a second. As far as what happens to us after death, Jews are not particularly, um, well, we underemphasize very much life after death or what happens in the world to come. They're not things that really um, engage Jewish thought very much. What really is, um, we, there is some concept of heaven and hell, but they're not significant in the great scheme of Jewish thinking. We sort of um, have a sense that God will look after that as long as we act with loving kindness on earth. The great emphasis is given to action on earth. More than belief, more than transcendence, more than enlightenment, in Judaism it is through action that we will achieve these other worthy states of being. 
What kind of action? One word is loving kindness. It's through the actions of loving kindness, or in Hebrew, chesed, that will bring um, us to this state of oneness and all those other things that are so lofty in our experience of spirit will come to us if we simply, to, if we simply do loving kindness. It has nothing to do with belief at all. We say deed before creed, in fact. So what is it to be holy? From a Jewish perspective, you visit the sick, you console the bereaved, you welcome the stranger, you bring peace where there is strife, you keep the Sabbath, you honor your parents. Really basic kinds of actions of human quality is what makes a Jew holy. It's as simple as that and as difficult. The, the acts of loving kindness are the things that will redeem us, that will be our salvation and will bring about the Messiah. So I can hardly mention the coming of the Messiah without taking a closer look at what this profound theology of Judaism is all about. Uh, in mainstream Judaism, which I would not consider myself to be necessarily um, a major advocate of, I'm much more of a mystical mind and there are many you know, different sects within Judaism, many of which are of a mystical nature. In mainstream Judaism, they look at the coming of the Messiah in a literal sense, that there will be a man who will come and bring peace to the world. Um, you know, no doubt it will be a man, and um, it will be complete salvation for all humankind, the end of war, of suffering, and of poverty. So while I think of the end of war, suffering, and poverty, I just want to tell you about this man who uh, apparently went to the wall in Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall, and prayed three times a day for 50 years. And a journalist was very moved by this man and went to interview him and asked him, what do you actually pray for? And in the morning he said, in, in the morning I pray for the end of all suffering. And at lunchtime I pray for peace, world peace in the world. And in the evening I pray for the end of all disease. And the journalist was very moved and she said, what is it like to pray for 50 years, three times a day like that. And he said, what's it like? It's like talking to a wall. <laughs> we Jews wait in hope. It's our natural state of being. There's a story that Elie Wiesel tells in Auschwitz in the concentration camp when the rabbis got together to decide and they decided to put God on trial. How could God exist? when so much suffering was occurring for them. And after three days and three nights in this famous trial that took place in Auschwitz, it was decreed, the verdict was, that God could not exist because of the suffering that they were witnessing. And then they turned to the chief rabbi and they said, so what shall we do now? And the rabbi said, now, we pray. We live in hope. That is our natural state of being. My preferred interpretation of the Messiah is not of a man and um, who will come, but uh, and I'm certainly not alone um, um, in, in that kind of interpretation. Um, what what we yearn for, what we wait for, I believe, is a messianic consciousness in ourselves that when we reach through actions of loving kindness, that place of non-dualism, non-judgment, that place of unconditional and unreasonable love, we will have come to a sense of consciousness that is messianic. I feel like I have a slight glimpse of that. My mother is profoundly demented. And when I go to visit her, um, my mother, when she sees me coming, although she doesn't know I'm her daughter, she knows that there's something about me that she loves, and she will often throw her eyes to the heaven and say, thank you, God, as I arrive, which is a very nice way to be greeted, I find. <laughs> we then sit facing each other, looking deeply into each other's eyes, and we seem to, in my mother's dementia, without any distraction of any ego or anything that seems to take her mind from what is her essence, her soul. She 
loves me in a way that I don't think I've ever really been loved before. We look deeply into each other's eyes, often just holding each other's hands and crying just for love. And I remember the, uh, not long ago, the other day, my mother was saying to me, you are perfection. You are, I love you so much. And I'm just soaking in these beautiful words of my mother. And then the woman with the medicine came and my mother looked up and she said, you are perfection. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized I'm witnessing that unconditional, unreasonable love that somehow has something to do with that messianic consciousness, I believe, that we all strive for and yearn for and wait for. Um, we have a character in Judaism that represents the world to come, redemption, and, it is the, and is the harbinger of the Messiah. It is Elijah, of whom there are many stories. He is the conduit between this world and the next, probably it's probably because he ascended in a chariot and died in a, in a sort of in a, a living way, in, in body, in, as it says in the, in the Tanakh, in the Torah. It said that when, uh, my, one of my favorite stories about Elijah is that when Elijah comes to earth disguised as this disgusting and suppurating and grotesque creature, and humanity embrace him with love, the Messiah will come. There's something for me about embracing that which we find most repulsive, that we reject in our hearts, that we find disgusting. When we come to that place of embracing that, then that world of oneness, of non-dualism, of non-judgment non must have descended upon us or been great. We must be graced by it. And that is what that legend speaks of in the in that phrase that the Messiah will come. The Messiah will come to us personally in our hearts, one by one, is what I believe. I work for an organization called Together for Humanity, where, I take, where we take a Jew, a Muslim, a Christian, and an indigenous person, sometimes a Buddhist, <laughs> um, and we go to the schools and we challenge assumptions and prejudice and look at commonality. One day, um, a, a child, who was a little Christian child, said to me, but how do you get forgiven? And it was very sincere in the question, because without Jesus, how am I to be forgiven? So, in terms of salvation, I told the child that we have a day, we have ten days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, two festivals. They're called the Days of Awe. And during those days, we are to really look into our heart and to ask forgiveness from anyone that we have hurt, to forgive someone, whoever it is that has hurt us, and to ask forgiveness from God, um, God too. We, on Yom Kippur, it's said that we are written in the book of life or death. What does it mean? It means that if we have been able to sincerely, I believe, um, sort of rid our hearts of the bitterness and, and to find forgiveness, um, from the year that has passed and really sort of complete with that, then we are writing ourselves essentially in the book of life. But if we have failed to do that, if we still hold on to our resentments and our bitterness and have failed to be able to forgive, then we might as well be writing ourselves in the book of death. You know, Leonard Cohen sings a song, you know, who by fire and who by water. You know that song? That is liturgy. That comes immediate. That comes directly from Yom Kippur. It is the prayer that we read when we are facing this sealing of our fate, the writing of life or death. In that prayer, there are three things that say that change the decree. It is tzedakah, teshuvah, and tefillah. Tefillah is prayer. In Judaism, we're really meant to wander around in a constant state of gratitude and say blessings for everything we see. A tree in full bloom, when we come to the sea, when we see a rainbow, when we see um, a, a friend after a year, or we see a dwarf or a giant who is different from us. It's a beautiful prayer, that one. If we see someone who is different, that, that, that sort of challenges us and they're different, the prayer is, Baruch Atad Melech Thank you, God, for the variety in creation. There are blessings for everything we see. 
And so the prayer is one thing that will change this decree on Yom Kippur of being written in the Book of Life or Death. The second is tzedakah. Tzedakah is not charity, although some people think it is. The word tzedakah comes from the word tzedek in Hebrew, which means justice. So Jews don't give charity. We make justice. So in some respects, charity, if you give charity, you are being a good person. If you don't give tzedakah, you are, you are failing in your responsibility. We are making justice. It is only fair. It is what is required of us. There's no big deal. The big deal is if you don't do it. Tzedakah. And then finally, um, the word teshuvah, which is repentance, but it's not repentance. It's once again action. It's not so much about your mind. That's part of it. But you have to do an action that will correct to make, to make some kind of um, attempt to make right through your actions what you have done wrong throughout the year. Teshuvah, tzedakah. To feel up. With those three things, we will find salvation and be redeemed. That is, the, that is um, what the, the prayer says, that same prayer that Linda Cohen sings on Yom Kippur. They're the three things we need to do. I just want to finish with a story. In the beginning, when the world had first begun, there was a whole lot of rock and a whole lot of water and a great big mess. And the angel said to God, Are you going to clean this place up? What do you think God said? Yes or no? Hands up, yes. Hands up, no. God said, yes. And God took some of the rock and he made stars and comets and planets and, and earth and mountains and cliffs and islands and some of the rock he left as rock. And he took the water and he made, star he made, he made lakes and oceans and rivers and streams and puddles and, and some of the water he left as water. And the angel said, wow, it's beautiful. Finish. What do you think? Yes or no? And God said, no. And God planted this extraordinary garden, more beautiful than the angels had ever seen. They were, they were wiped out with, with joy. They couldn't believe it. They said, that is so beautiful. Finish. And God said, no. And then God made the animals that swooped and flew and flapped and galloped and slunk and trotted and, and swam and jumped and filled the earth with pairings of animals. The angels were deeply in Wow. Finished? And God said, no. And then God took some of the rock and some of the water and he made clay and out of that man and woman and into them he breathed an eternal soul. Angels were fainting. Unbelievable. Finish. What do you think? Yes or no? And God said, no. They were finished. And those two little creatures looked up and said, us? What do you mean us? We don't even know what the plans are. You've got all the plans. You've got the ideas. What do you mean? And God said, you shall be my partners. Well, what's a partner? Well, you know, when you've got a big task and you get tired, the other person keeps going and you don't give up until it's done. Is it a deal? So what do you think they said? Yes or no? And they said yes. And eons, and eons later, the angel said to God, are you finished? And God said, you'll have to ask my partner. In Judaism, in the end, we have two ways to view redemption. One is that redemption will come when God is ready. It's all in God's hand. But on the other side, it is that redemption involves a partnership between God and people. The last word in Genesis is la'asot, which means to do. God has created the world incompletely, and it's up to us to finish it. The part in partnership, we will redeem the world. As much as we yearn for redemption, redemption yearns for us. As much as we await the Messiah, Messiah waits for us. As much as we search for God, God searches for us. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. I'll pass it on to David. 
I was moved by what Donna said about her mother because I have a lady in my church called Verna who is in the early stages of um, Alzheimer's disease. When I first arrived at my church uh, a couple of years ago, she came to me and she had the most wonderfully warm and gentle face and she took my hands and looked at me and she said, you have a beautiful voice, you have a lovely smile, and we are so happy that you are here at our church. <laughs> and I said, oh, what a lovely person. <laughs> and about 20 minutes later, she came back to me and she took my hands and she looked into my face and she said the same thing and I just felt all the better. <laughs> and then I realised what was going on. So now what I do is whenever I have a visitor at the church, I introduce them to Vernon. <laughs> And she takes them by the hand and looks into their faces. And they feel so accepted and uh, loved. They like, think, oh, what a beautiful church this is. That's yeah, accepting people. Um, it is a, um, it's a very enlivening thing to be asked, uh, for a, a, a theologian to be asked to talk about salvation and liberation. What can be more delicious? and to address an issue like that because it is at the heart of what religion is about. It's my view that it, it constitutes one of the defining characteristics of religion. I think all religions uh, perform three functions. One is a type of philosophical function. All religions have got to address big questions. These are the questions that actually go beyond philosophy, well at least the sort of philosophy that we've been practicing in the West over the last hundred years or so. Uh, these are the questions about meaning and purpose and uh, the, nature, the questions that go to the nature of who we are and what, what is the purpose in life and so on. And that is one of the functions of religion, is to give us some sort of philosophical framework so we can penetrate those sort of deep issues about ourselves and where we stand in the nature of uh, things and, and what the purpose of this life is. Uh, we need to be able to address those sort of questions. The second function of religion, I believe, is an ethical function. Religions provide people with a... a uh, a framework within which people can develop values and principles that help them to determine the great ethical questions that uh, will, will in some senses define their character and the way they behave themselves in this life. And that goes to all matters, the way we conduct ourselves in relation to other people, the way we deal with our money, uh, the way we deal with uh, our sexuality, the way we handle violence and so on. And that is one of the functions of religion. And the third function of religion is, this, is uh, what theologians call the soteriological function, which has to do with salvation. All religions must give us some grasp on salvation. And without that, a religion is shallow and pointless. And in the end will not maintain its followers to any sort of extent. It will be shallow in the type of allegiance it will ask of people and it will be shallow in terms of the way it deals with the complexities of this life. So, salvation is of the very nature of what we are on about. You as Buddhists, me as a Christian and so on. So, I guess you've got to ask the question, well, what is, uh, what is salvation? I mean, clearly, I mean, I'm talking as a Christian, but I guess I ought to say that I'm not speaking for Christianity as a whole. It would be too presumptuous because I don't know anyone that can speak for the entire corpus of Christianity. I know Donna doesn't think she's speaking for the entire world of, of Judaism because there are things within your own religion that you find that you differ with. And I, and, and I know the great distinction within Buddhism between the Theravada and the Mahayana 
it, it is such that at times you wonder whether or not they are even reconcilable. And there is within my own religion uh, positions and camps that when I look at them I think, how the hell can we both call ourselves Christians? So, I'm talking for myself, but I'm also, I hope, uh, uh, talking in some senses for what I regard as orthodox and tr traditional Christianity because I tend to be quite orthodox in my own beliefs. So, what, what is it, if we, if we talk about salvation, what is it that we are being saved from? What is the problem? Now, I think all religions begin with the assumption that something is wrong. If we didn't think anything was wrong, why would we worry? We would just go about our business. We would not be troubled. And we wouldn't be on this sort of restless search to, to, to discover how we make our way through the complexities of this life. If we didn't suffer, if we didn't feel a sense of uh, compromise, frustration, anger, uh, if we didn't at times hunger <coughs> for revenge, I felt that very thick today, as a matter of fact. I had to grapple with an issue. In fact, I had a friend on the phone saying, David, revenge is something that you deliver cold. He was quoting my opinion. Because I've, um, I've been involved in a, a legal case. I've been sued 12 times because one of my other lives, apart from being a United Church minister, is I, I make television programs. I make... I, I make generally Four Corners programs, 60 Minutes programs, and I'm actually working with the Sunday night program with Channel 7 at the moment. And I tend to make these programs about new religious movements and cults. And whenever I make one of those programs, I get sued. <laughs> and this is a case that's been going on for 12 years. It was a Four Corners program in the 90s. I, uh, and, and at the during the week that the program went to where I wrote a feature article in the Sydney Morning Herald. The article was called The Prophet of the Posh. And it was a program about Jeremy Griffith and the Foundation for Humanities Adulthood. And he has been pursuing me the a and the ABC and he's um, and, and, and also Fairfax and the and today, the lawyers from Fairfax called me up and said, we're going to settle. This is what we're doing. We are going to apologise and say the following words. In 1995, the Sydney Morning Herald published uh, an article written by Reverend Dr. David Millikan in which he said the following things. We believe there is no truth in this and we apologise. Fairfax is bleeding money at the moment, and so they buckled, and I hit the roof, I said some very unbiblical terms. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I don't know why I didn't mean, tell that. It's tender, you can see how stirred up I am about it. So, what is the issue? In general terms, if you look at human history, what you see is this terrible paradox. Look at, the, look at the 20th century, good grief. What an extraordinary paradox is there of both glorious advances and discoveries. You see the very best of human beings and the ingenuity of the human mind, our capacity for organisation and the development of science and, and so on. But at the same time, the last hundred years have been the most barbaric in human history. We perhaps have seen the murder, torture, destruction of up to a hundred million people in wars and, and, uh, and, and all manner of conflicts. And it was interesting to me to see the way we lived into the 21st century. Remember those celebrations at the end of the century? I watched those. No one was going to address the fundamental question. Is it going to be the same? Have we any reason to believe as human beings 
as we go into this new century, that somehow we'll get our act together. So that is the question that all religions, I believe, are dealing with. It's the question of how do we address that fundamental issue concerning the persistence of violence in human history. Christianity has an answer, Buddhism has an answer, Islam has an answer, and so on. If you go back to the story of the uh, Garden of Eden, which uh, Donna made reference to, it, the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Scriptures talks about the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in the second chapter, it says that God created the garden, put the man and the woman into the garden, and said, of all the trees you can eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you cannot eat, if you do eat, you will surely die. Now, it's not saying, if you eat from that tree, I'm going to kill you. It's saying something else, as I understand it. It's saying, if you, as a human being, step outside the limits of who you are as a creature and take on the role of being God and take to yourself the weight of deciding what is good and evil in this world, then the burden of that will crush you. And that is what has happened. So in that sense, there lies the root of the, of the problem. Now what is interesting to me is if you go to the Quran, the Quran also talks about the, uh, the, uh, the Garden of Eden. And it, it more or less duplicates the story, but with some subtle differences. What it says is that at a certain point in the creative process, God made the decision to create human beings. And God went to the angels and said, I'm going to make a vice regent that will, put, that will stand in the world as my agent. And the angels, and, and then God brought this person, Adam, to the angels and said, now I want you to bow down and prostrate yourself before this vice regent. And all the angels did except Iblis. And he couldn't stand it. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. And he was banished. And that's Iblis is Satan. And, the, the, and so Satan then set about himself as an act of revenge to subvert the, the relationship between Adam and God. And, and Iblis prevailed on them to eat from the tree. But the difference is this. In Islam, the weight of responsibility for that act of disobedience lies with Iblis, not with the human beings. So in that sense, you could say, that right there you have this fundamental difference of emphasis that creates a whole different culture. It, it changes your attitude to law, to education, to the way you understand who you are and so forth. And what it has done in a sense is in Christianity it has created a culture of guilt and in Islam it has created a culture of blame. And so the concept of salvation now has got to address those two different understandings. So, I'm running out of time. Who owns salvation within Christianity? That in itself is a very contentious issue. There is a doctrine within the church that um, uh, still flourishes in, in sections of the Catholic Church called extra ecclesium nulla salis. Outside the church there is no salvation. And that still exists. In other words, you have a section of Christianity saying, we own salvation. Now that is not my view, and that is not the view of the Protestant church, if you wish. That's a, uh, I mean, that is a very Protestant thing for me to say. Uh, the church does not own salvation, the church is the servant of salvation. And that requires an act of humility in the way we deal with it. So. One of the tendencies in religion, and it's, uh, you see the same within certain Buddhist groups, is that they say they also have the doctrine of extra ecclesia nullis alis. Outside of our group, there is no salvation. And there is a dark seduction within religion that has to do with salvation. So, 
uh, uh, maybe I can talk about that later in question time. But um, so, what is it? Um, salvation for Christians is a a restoration, if you like, of the relationship that was severed between human beings and God. It begins in a sense with the philosophical assumption that God participates in the affairs of this, this world, that God is an active agent that steps into this world and initiates an opportunity, a way of re-establishing the relationship. We believe that we bear the responsibility for the problem that has developed both amongst ourselves and in our relationship with God. And it is God who has given us a way of re-establishing that. Now the relationship between that and liberation is this. Liberation, if, if you could say that salvation is a theological term. Liberation is a political term. I believe that salvation, that the two are together. There is no salvation without liberation. The salvation that I understand that was delivered by, by Jesus was not salvation for the soul. We don't believe in immortality of the soul. We believe in resurrection of the body. Which means that salvation is about the flesh, not just the soul. So in that sense, the most pernicious thing, I believe, that can happen to any sort of Christian church is to think that it is no longer engaged in the stuff of this world. If they begin to think that the message of Jesus is not political, it's not, it is not going to put you in, right into the thick of this world, then you are, you are subverting the entire message of what Jesus was on about. The last thing Jesus said to his disciples when he left, and this, uh, this is something I said to the pastor at Hillsong when uh, he wrote a book some years ago called You Need More Money. <laughs> that was the name of the book. <laughs> and I wrote a, a, a somewhat scathing review. And I called him up and I said, Brian, I need to send you a review. It's rather rude, and I think you, might, you better look at it before I publish it. I sent it to him, and he was at white heat. And he said three things to me. He said, how dare you criticise one of God's anointed? I said, good grief. <laughs> so what the hell are you saying? The second thing he said to me was, you are acting like all the traditional clergy have acted over the years. You have hidden the prosperity gospel from people as a way of controlling them. And three, he said, you're jealous. <laughs> I said, Brian, one out of three is not bad. <laughs> but, and then I said, Brian, if if the gospel is what you say it is, then what did Jesus say to his disciples in that last night before he was crucified? Did he say to them, you blokes have followed me for three years. You've been, you've been faithful and good to me. You're all going to get houses down by the coast. You're all going to have beautiful wives and wonderful children. You're going to be prosperous. You're going to live an abundant life. And you're going to have an honourable place within society. He doesn't say that. He looks at them in the eye and he says, in this life, you are going to have troubles. But be at peace, I have overcome the world. And there is, there, that's what, to me, salvation is about. It's, it's going into the world, not escaping. So. Sorry, you'll you just be, you'll be pleased to know, David, that we did actually plan, or we were talking about getting a, a Hillsong pastor to come down for this event this evening, but uh, we couldn't, so we had to settle for you instead. So. <laughs> we thought it might be fun to see what their take on things was, and to wonder we were wondering whether they actually had a genuine spirituality underlying the prosperity.
or not, and so we thought it might be worth having a chat with them about it. Anyway, that may be maybe maybe some future event. Yeah. Yes. Well, look, if, if we do do that in the future, we'll definitely make sure that you're along as well. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, mate. <laughs> do you want to ask Catherine? Um, uh, I'm just wondering whether we should have a break now. Even though the talk's there, I can see it's alive. We'd like to have a break now, we'll have one more speaker and then one more speaker. Shalom Aleikum. Shalom Aleikum. Peace be with everybody. How many of you know what a Sufi is? <laughs> um, do you mind if I get up and travel a little bit? No, no it's okay. Got a fairly short lead, though. All right, all right. Getting a little antsy here. Um, in Sufism, we tell a lot of stories as well. One of the characters in our stories is Nasruddin, a Turkish character. Uh, one of the stories that comes to mind is that Nasruddin had written a book. Everybody had read, read the book. Well, some had. So they came to hear him speak. And he got up and he said, how many of you have read my book? And half of the people raised their hands. He says, oh, I guess I don't need to talk. And he left. Came back the next week. Another talk. He said, how many people have read my book? Well, half raised their hand again. He said, well, if you haven't read my book, what's the point of being here? So he left again. Third week, he comes in, half the people, once again, how many of you read my book? Half raised their hands. Said, okay, great. You people tell those people what the book is about. And he left. <laughs> now, Sufism has many different colors and, and schools. One that you may have heard about is, is the Whirling Dervishes. That was a group set up by Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi in about the 12th century. And the point of it with the Whirling Dervishes and everything was to kick people's butt. There were people who were just sitting around being holy and sacred, and I'm being very spiritual, I'm a spiritual person, I, I have things that I'm, I'm being sacred about, and I'm, I'm very sacred and holy. He said, screw that, get up and dance. <laughs> Start moving around. So with banging the drum, people started having to turn around and broke their idea of who they were. They weren't who they thought they were, and this was a way of understanding Self. Not the self of the little one, but the big self. The self that's connected to everything. I just saw a uh, wonderful documentary on how we came to be as beings. Now, the Big Bang happened, there was suddenly the universe, stars and everything, but the only problem was that only hydrogen and oxygen and a couple simple atoms could be created in this. It wasn't until there was a nova when the star could collapse into its iron core, explode, and compress all of those atoms and become complex atoms. We're all from these novas. We couldn't be without stars exploding. And that's where we come from. Now, for Sufis, salvation, it doesn't mean anything. It's like, please, save me from myself. <laughs> and as for, what was the other one? Liberation? Please, free me from myself. Because this being here just gets in the way of being with the divine. What is Sufism? Sufism is like the water in an underground river. And the different religions use this water, like Buddhism and Christianity and Judaism, and draw the water up from that well. It's the same water, it's the same spirit, it has a different name, but it's still the essence. And this essence is what you are. 
And the way that we use our practice in Sufism is just one of many ways that ancient traditions have been going on about how to free yourself, how to become one with the divine, with Allah, with God, with Buddha, the Buddha mind, Buddha nature, reality, whatever you want to call it. I don't care what you call it because as soon as you give it a name, it limits. There is no name for the thing that you're connected to. So freedom, salvation, reality, with each breath that you take, you are connected to it. And any time that you start thinking about me, myself, I, mine, you've just jammed the signal. <coughs> and the practice of being present, of what these good people have talked about, of being present with this moment, with this reality, with this essence, is what freedom looks like, and you have a, every moment another chance to put that into action. As Donna has said, it's about action. In Sufism, we also combine that with intention. That intention and action have to be resonating. They have to be in synchronization for the actual action to be pure. I mean, I can think about, well, I'm helping somebody else, but uh, uh, there's that I again. So, we say it's through service, and the more that you do service for helping other people, the more that you can learn how to get out of the way. And we say in Sufism, get out of your way and die before you die. To die before you die means to let go of all the habits, all the preferences, the biases, whatever holds you to this world is connecting you to the undivine. Whereas you could be with the divine at any moment, just like that. Oh, I'm here. Alhamdulillah. Now, I don't speak for the mosque people. I don't speak for Muslims. I do not speak for, I'm not an imam and I'm not any of those kinds of things. I am telling you what my Sufi tradition is about, which is Islam. Islam means surrender. Now, I don't know any religion that's been around for less than a thousand years that doesn't talk about surrender. Jesus certainly talked about it. Moses talks about it. Abraham talks about it. As a matter of fact, every prophet that's ever come to this world, though they use a different language, a different culture, the message is the same. Would you be good to each other, help each other, be respectful of each other, be tolerant, and let go of who you think you are so that you can get out of the way and be with God. Freedom. Liberation. <laughs> Is that clear? <laughs> so, that's about all I've got. That's, unless somebody has a question. <laughs> Shut up and get on with life and quit thinking about yourself so much. <laughs>